eat meat don't eat repeat if you're not hungry for meat then you're not actually hungry mm. you have what i call fake hunger i am uh i think probably around the time that you and i first met when you had me up to your to your studio i have really become super interested in dialing up my training game and so i've been really focused on building muscle and uh and getting stronger and so i want to get into your exact protocol for getting shredded, getting strong, getting jacked. Um, Cause I love learning from guys like you have been just so steeped in this. We got topic. a little lifting in when you were at my gym. We did. Yeah. Cause I've got like low back issues and you showed me a lot mm -hmm. of really useful stuff. I think the, th the thing to keep in mind is like, there's a lot of research and there's a lot of, there's a lot of things to think about when you're thinking about strength training, as it's said nowadays. Um, but the good news is that you can get so much, a little bit goes a long way. If you're new, I don't think you have to really worry a ton about the science. I don't think you have to worry a ton about, hey, you need 12 sets, 10 sets uh, per body part per week in order to get hypertrophy. I actually think that, that information is totally false for someone that's new. Hmm. For someone that's been training for a while, of course, you might need a certain amount of work. It makes sense, right? You, you, uh, Humans are highly adaptive to just about anything. Temperature, um, we're, we can adapt to any environment almost over a period of time. So when it comes to training, yeah, your body does get used to it. And your body will get used to lifting five pounds. So maybe eventually you need to go to the eights and the tens and so on. And they maybe need more sets and more reps over time. But in the beginning, if you can, we don't necessarily, we don't necessarily need a gym, but where we are in the United States at this time, we kind of need a gym hmm. because where else are you going to get this done? I don't know if people have the motivation and stuff like that to, you know, do body, body weight workouts at home. And, and so on. some people do, but for the most part, you're going to get it done at the gym. And if you just go to the gym and you just literally dick around, <laughs> just literally mess around. My son has done that. My son is 20 and he's in great shape right now. And it started, his journey started by him just kind of messing around the gym. And I always wanted to go over and be like, hey, I, but I was like, don't say anything. Just be pumped that he's here. He's here. He's with his friends. He's exercising. He's doing stuff. Who cares if it's not the exact right thing, the exact right way? He's still getting jacked. Hmm. What, do, what do you say to people who are intimidated by gym culture? I, th I think there's this misconception or this perception at least and and. I think it's a misconception, but maybe I'm sure you can speak to it uh, in a more, in a more um, authoritative way. That you know that the that going to the gym, especially for the first time, is a is a is an intimidating it can be an mm. in, intimidating experience, and that people are yeah. generally not cool in gyms; that they're not nice. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times it's uh, you know what you have going on on the inside, and you don't feel comfortable. Mm. You don't feel comfortable going in. You're you feel that you're too fat, you feel that you're too skinny, you feel that people are gonna be looking at you. Um, and I think, interestingly enough, the guys that are really big, <laughs> it, we're in such a warped world that we're, I'm not that big in a lot of gyms. Like I was at Gold's Gym Venice the other day and you know, I just am a sort of regular size amongst a lot some of the guys that are in there. We all have body dysmorphia, I feel like these days. I think so too. And, but I think that's what can make it intimidating for some people. Uh, but I think something to realize and recognize is that somebody that's been in the gym for a long time, like myself, a lot of times you're going to find that these people are, they want to be really helpful. Like if someone was to ask me a question, I would, I would spend time with them. I would actually show, show them it's, uh, not any different than making money. You know, if you, if you were to, you know, maybe knocking on someone's door is not the appropriate thing, but if you saw that the neighbor had a really beautiful boat or beautiful car out front, you say, hey, man, I, wow, that's really nice. I would love to know how, you mind telling me how you got that? How'd you get there? And if you ask some dude at the gym how he got his, you know, 18-inch arms or how he got a six-pack, he more than likely isn't going to blow you off. He's going to say, hey, you know, it's taken this, this, and this, and he'll probably give you a long-ass story about how it's a, a journey of consistency and balancing things out like over a really long period of time. Mm. Yeah, the people in the gym that um, probably know the most and that, that are more likely to know, that seem more likely to know what it is that they're doing 
are probably the ones that are more likely to reach out and offer a helping hand if you just you know if you just ask one of the things i love about your content is that you uh you seem to go back and forth in in a really good way of talking about the science and then talking about the practical Hmm. and even something even something uh sometimes people will talk about highly processed foods like there's you can't have any processed foods and then it's like, well, hold on a second. There's some processed foods that might be pretty good, that might be advantageous. Uh, there's nowadays we have uh, we got kind of health products. We have supplements. We have whey protein. We have vitamins. We have minerals. Maybe we don't get the same minerals from the soil that we used to get. Maybe mm-hmm. we don't get the same vitamins from our beef, or maybe we don't get the same vitamins from maybe our apple is different than it used to be. Or there's tons of possibilities with all that stuff, and so maybe a supplement, which is a processed thing. Um, maybe there's room for some of that. And in my, uh, my own diet, I make a lot of room for those things. Now, I would say that some of these companies that have these uh, net carb products, I would yeah. say the smaller the company and the newer the company, I would just say <laughs> you have to kind of test it on yourself, see how your stomach reacts to it and all these different things because these things can cause a tremendous amount of gas. Dude, totally. And they can cause all, they can wreak havoc. So, I mean, if something's giving you like, just something like a, something as simple as giving you gas, I mean, that's not a great, no. whether it's a vegetable or whether it's a carb or whether it's a protein or whatever it is, if you're just, you know, if your stomach is always getting bloated from that, that's a good sign that that's probably not something uh, that's, that's for you. But, you know, a lot of these things, they have like the net carbs in there. I think there's some confusion around that. People are like, I'm not so sure. Well, some of these things are supposed to be things that don't digest. Well, it's like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> it doesn't digest. Uh, and maybe you're just, you know, shitting it out or whatever, whatever the case may be. But I have found that some of those products um, can be helpful. And there's these are things that you can get at Walmart, at Target. For me, they're helpful because... I like to be pretty strict on the diet. I would say I'm like 90% compliant and there's probably like five or 10% of my diet that's, you know, legendary foods uh, or uh, a quest bar, something along those lines. Fun foods. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're a little off plan. They're not necessarily like the diet is mainly meat and fruit, vegetables, um, a potato here or there, some rice, some extra carbohydrate, depending on what I did or what I'm doing. Um, But it's like, I want to taste something different. I don't want to just have uh, savory foods all the time. I want something sweeter. And even fruit, as sweet as fruit is, I think that our taste buds have kind of gotten desensitized and we just want, because I'll find myself mixing all kinds of stuff together. And I'm like, why am I doing this? I'm just blasting the crap out of my taste buds. So even stuff like that, I'll try to question, you know, how much am I doing of this? Why do I do it? Yeah. And I think the why I think is really important. Like, why do people, why do people eat the way they eat? There's tons of podcasts out. There's tons of books. We got a bunch of books right here. There's tons of information everywhere. There's there's a for every bad product that you can buy, there's good products. You know, people will say, "Oh man, you know, we have uh, uh, DoorDash, and you know that's that's our demise." <laughs> but you can order healthy stuff off of DoorDash, uh-huh. just like the internet. The internet can be a place where you consume pornography and consume all kinds of stuff and all kinds of things that uh, might not be great for you, but there's tons of great things on the internet as well. Exactly. It's a tool like any other, like fire can either burn you or cook your food, you know? I want to go back to the whole processed food thing that you mentioned, because that's, it's such a great point that you raised. And, you know, I've, and you to a much larger degree than me, over the past let's say six years that I've been like really publicly doing this, I've seen a sort of turning of the tides where now on social media it's become, it's very easy to build a large following by fear mongering certain foods Mm. and by being really dogmatic about your dietary choices. And out of the gate, I might've, that might not have been as big of a thing on social media. And now that, but now that I see it, it's made me change to the degree that 
I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm hyper conscious now of not fear mongering, blind spot. Yeah, of, of not, or... of not being dogmatic and of not fear mongering certain foods. And I'm presenting, you know, taking the, bringing more diligence and nuance to the communication around, mm -hmm. um, you know, the potential benefits of of, of certain processed I mean, foods. Look, do we even really, example. do we even really truly know whether seed oils are bad? Yeah, I mean, that's Do a... we really actually know? I would say, like, if they're heated and stuff like that and you're getting them to high temperatures and burning the crap out of them, that doesn't sound like a great idea. Right. They're no longer in their original form and stuff like that. And I understand, like, you know, canola oil and all the different things they do to break them down. But the information seems to be kind of fuzzy. Yeah. So what, what's your take on... I want to, you know, obviously this is, this is one of many potential controversial topics that we can cover, but what's your current read on the seed oil situation? Well, I would just say I'm not a fan of oil, period. I don't really see where it fits into your diet. Interesting. It's just such a, like, just a fast energy dump of consumption. Uh, maybe it would have made sense, like, if, if, if we made oil, like, thousands of years ago. Like, we made, imagine if we made coconut oil, like, thousands of years ago. Um, people, uh, you know, trying to get across the country or people uh, exploring and walking thousands of miles or whatever to get from one spot to another probably could have been really useful yeah. to have like oil. But uh, we have such an abundance of food nowadays. I don't really know what you would use oil for. I think that you can cook with it sometimes. Occasionally you can use maybe a little bit of oil. Um, but I think people are just, when it comes to oil, I would say, when it comes to any of this stuff, you always have to go back to if you don't overconsume it, it's probably not a huge problem. Right. You know, the poison a lot of times is in the dosage. And this goes for carbohydrates and this goes for, I mean, protein doesn't seem to have as much of that limiting factor, but I'm sure you could, we'll probably learn that you can overdo that as well. It's probably just a matter of time before we have the science for that. Um, but when it comes to like cholesterol, when it comes to oil, when it comes to any of these things, it's like, I don't know if our arteries, uh, I don't know if we start to uh, accumulate plaque if you're not over consuming. You might have saturated fat, you might have sugar, your diet might not look great, but if you normally have an energy expenditure of like 2,500 and for the day, um, uh, for that day you ate 2,000 calories, why, why would extra energy show up in bad spots like it doesn't can't make something out of nothing yeah right so it <laughs> yeah i mean technically you should be like probably losing weight if if you're in a i'm not a huge fan of the of the calorie uh system because i believe a calorie is a calorie outside the body but once it travels inside the body the way that your body's going to interpret calories is going to be different than mine and so on. We don't have that information. We don't have that technology to ever figure that out. We never, I don't think we ever will. Um, and protein is a weird one. It doesn't seem like it, in my opinion, I think that protein is free, uh, especially for those who work out because protein is a, con is a constant thing that's regenerating and it's, um, it's being utilized. It's, it's like part of your body. You know, you're not, you don't really store protein, but I guess you have protein like, uh, represented on your body in terms of ligaments, tendons, muscles, and so on. Yeah, that makes a that makes a ton of sense, and I totally, I I totally agree about oil, primarily because it's the it's the most calorie dense food product that exists. You get the same amount of calories in a tablespoon of oil that you get in a large Honeycrisp apple, and you're not getting any satiety benefit from the oil. I think even the name is wrong. You know, I think we call it like we call it seed oils. We we say that all the time, and it should mainly be called restaurant oil mm. because people need to understand that that's where it's coming from in their diet, and it's coming from processed food. So if you stay away from your little uh, bag of chips or bag of this or that, um, those things probably have a lot of those oils in them. Again, I don't think those oils are that bad. If you're having a 90 calorie bag of something small and you're not over consuming for the day, I don't think it really matters that much. But uh, if I was to like bet or guess, I would say, look, if we just keep going back to do your best to stick with natural whole foods. I know the message has been out there for a long time, but if you stick with those foods, it's going to be very difficult 
to overeat. And if you don't overeat, everything should be good. Yeah, you're so right. From a from like the macro vantage point, energy balance. Real, it's it's like bad things happen when you overconsume when you overconsume any every nutrient pretty much aside from po- maybe protein, right? But like if you overconsume saturated fat, bad things will happen. If you overconsume fructose, bad mm-hmm. things will happen, and it makes it less. You're less likely to overconsume these nutrients in isolation when you base your diet primarily around whole foods because nutrients don't exist in isolation in whole foods. Yeah, even if you were to eat, let's say you ate an apple, and you're like, oh my God, an apple's great. And then you ate another apple. It's like, how many? <laughs> how many can you eat? How many are you going to eat? I yeah. mean, if you were, even if you're really ravenously hungry, um, you know, l- luckily we don't have like a lot of starvation and stuff like that anymore, but in this country... But if you were to eat like three apples, even if you have a pretty big appetite, like that's a lot. I've never, I've never done that before. No, you'd be pretty gassy too. I think <laughs> yeah. after eating three apples, trying to break, up. trying to break down all that fiber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, uh, you know, Honeycrisp apple is like one of the most delicious foods for me. Like I'm, I love Honeycrisp apples. After eating one, it's not like I have ever felt compelled to go and eat a second Honeycrisp apple. Right. Which is like. So insane when you think about it, and you compare that to the sensation that you get when you're eating these ultra processed snack foods. I think the I think one of the things is is that when you eat when you eat highly processed foods, even the ones that are good for you, the cool thing about them is none of them are so dead on that it makes it super easy to overeat. Hmm. So if you have you know a Quest chip or something, you have some of these things that are. Uh, I love those, by the way. I, I love all that stuff. Yeah, legendary foods. I think they knocked it out of the park. But they make the tasty pastry, and they make the uh, the pop tart things. The pop tart thing, and they make the, um, the sweet rolls. Those things are unbelievable, and they have like twenty grams of protein in them and stuff. They taste great. Throw it in the microwave. It's even better. Nice and warm, gooey. It, it kind of has all those flavor textures and everything you're looking for. But it's not the same as like a donut, or it's not the same as a cookie. So you eat one. And you're like, it doesn't like rev your appetite up even higher. It's uh, it's like you're satisfied with that. It didn't taste so amazing that you just feel like you have to have more of it. There's something about it where it, uh, and hopefully they never, hopefully they never get it right. Hopefully they never nail it all the way to the point where it's so good that you can't stop because then you'll be back in the same spot again. Yeah, exactly. So true. But I have had that happen with stuff like that. And I have, you know, eaten three or four of those in a row. And then you end up with gas and you end up learning. And so even that side of it, I think, is actually kind of a good thing because it's like a governor. It's putting Mm. a governor on it at some point where with pizza or ice cream for me, I'll just just devour the shit out of it. I've even started to buy. I used to buy default buy a lot of these like, quote unquote, keto ultra processed products. Mm hmm. Because I used to believe that they were better for you than the original products that had added sugar. Right. But if you eat, you know, one of these, like, for example, we'll take like keto sugar free ice cream. First of all, the, the caloric load is often higher than it is for the original product. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because keto generally is going to imply high fat. Right. So the calorie load is, can often, not always, but can often be higher than the original product. But then the, the fake, like, added, the fake fiber extracts that they use, right, to displace the sugar. Like you eat a little too much and suddenly you've got like the most insane gas. It's like you can't (laughs) can't leave the house, you know? (laughs) It's like really problematic. It's like really bad. So now at this point, I've stopped like kind of buying those products. I'll buy the original because like, you know, a couple teaspoons of added sugar Mm -hmm. that your body knows what to do with, you know? I think is probably and is not going to cause all those GI that all that GI distress. Probably better for you. Probably better choice and the calorie load, all that stuff. I think one of the best things that people can do, and I've said this many times, if you just increase the percentage of protein that you eat, mm. if you get yourself out of the gutter of like being in this like five ten percent of your diet as protein, some people might even be ten fifteen percent. Um, if you can just raise, if everyone was to raise their percentage of protein, they would lose weight. And I've had people go, wait a second. You know, I've posted that on social media before and people are always like, Lane Norton's going to come after you. I'm like, no, again, you have to think about what I said. I said, if you raise the percentage of protein. So when you raise that percentage, we're still going based off of a hundred percent. So if you went from 20 to 40% protein, which is actually quite difficult, 
you went to 40% of your calories from protein, that means you lowered your real energy, which comes from fats and carbohydrates. And I think uh, Ted Naiman, I think, has it uh, more, uh, he has it down uh, in a way that I haven't really heard other people describe. But he has an entire book, and his book is really well done. But it's called uh, Protein Versus Energy, or P Versus E is his diet. And he just bluntly says, carbs and fats are energy. Protein is not a great energy source for the body. It doesn't mean that it never can be, because the body will do all kinds of crazy things, and it will convert uh, it will just magically convert stuff into other things when needed. But, uh, you know, having uh, sufficient protein each and every day will, can help keep you satiated. It can help keep you full. Sometimes the problem is you might be satiated, but you might not be satisfied. And so that's where you got to kind of fill in the rest of your diet. Like, how do I, how do I kind of fill this in? But if you think about it throughout each and every day, even, even years ago, maybe in the 80s or so, when they started talking about low fat, <laughs> it's just funny the way these things circle around. Yeah. You've because, seen it all, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I think that low fat will make a comeback because low fat is really important. Like to, to moderate the amount of fat that you consume is super smart because where's most of the energy coming from? Most of the energy is the easiest to eat in fat. That's why I said earlier, I don't understand what you even need oil for. Mm. Um, I guess maybe just to like put, you know, in the pan so your egg whites don't burn, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, something like that. But, and I know that people are like, no, that that's, that's what made us fat. And it's like, no, it didn't. That, that didn't make us fat. Um, the food pyramid didn't make us fat. Overconsumption of food and losing control of our diet made us fat. Mm. And having a lot of technology and a lot of things that just allow us to be a little bit, you know, sit down a little bit more, not move around as much. Those are the things that are a huge part of it. So you got to figure out a way to keep moving. And I think it makes a lot of sense to track and to pay attention. So I'm not like a, I'm not like tracking. I'm not like writing stuff down and calculating all the time, but I will periodically like check and I'll be like, okay, that's, you know, 600 calories. Now it's 400. And I'll go, oh man, uh, for today, you know, for me, if I can land around, you know, close to 3,000 calories, it's like a, a pretty good day. I should be able to maintain what I have and I shouldn't gain or anything like that. And so when I look at that, it might be like midday and I'm like, oh, I think I already ate like 2,500 calories. Now I don't have. So I like to put the calories later in the day Ooh. when I have less stuff to do. Um, I know there's like a circadian rhythm to the whole thing and there's like a lot of theories and a lot of different information, but I don't really care too much about that. I care more about what fits into my lifestyle. How am I going to make this work for me and how am I going to make this work consistently for me? So the way that I do it is I just front load the day mainly with protein. I usually have a protein shake in the morning. Um, if I wake up early enough, which is most of the time, I'll have like two eggs and maybe a couple egg whites with that. Uh, and I don't necessarily like fast. I don't do a lot of like intermittent fasting. I have done it in the past. I liked some of it, but I think that intermittent fasting is kind of intermittent fatting because you don't store protein. Hmm. And I think that your body, if you're lifting, if you're exercising, I think your body needs that protein, needs those amino acids. Plus what I've learned from fasting is that if you, if you fast, throughout the day and you make it to like 18 hours and then you binge you're wasting your time yeah you suffered for no reason you blew it you effed up your fast like you you were doing you did so great you maybe only you know for the day maybe you had you know zero calories until 2 p.m or something and then 2 p.m came around and you ate you got satisfied satiated you felt pretty good and maybe you ate again at like five and you're like oh, i'm gonna try to wrap it up for the day but you can't Hmm. because the human body is just too smart. You're going to start looking through the pantry. You're going to start thinking of, oh, what can I order from DoorDash? And at that point, you know, what you're going to order past 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m. is probably going to be something that's not great for you. Exactly. I love the strategy that you offer. It's so smart to, to really kind of like eat lighter during the day, um, especially because our big social meal tends to be at night. You know, maybe you're more inclined to eat out at night. 
which is like always going to be a caloric wild card. For me, it's with my family. So yeah, it's with your family. Yeah. So you want to be able to enjoy a big meal. So it's smart to control the, to focus on what you can control, which tends to be the meals that you are more likely to eat in isolation, which is like your morning pre-workout meal, maybe your like lunch or whatever. And to save the big calorie. Do I know what the secret is? Payoff for (laughs) what? Tell me. The secret is to get in as much protein without any other calories coming through. So if you can do that, especially in that in that uh, early time, you know, from the time you wake up until two or three p.m. So rather than fasting, think about I'm going to eat hardly any calories, but the calories I'm going to consume are going to be from protein. Front load your day that way, and the rest of your day is going to be cake. The right. rest of your day will be easy because uh, you did. Your body knows. Your body keeps track. Your body keeps score. Your body's not like it's not like oh he fed me. I'm good. No, your body, you're a certain size. Your body requires a certain amount of energy every day, and it's going to go searching around for it. Your mind is going to be wandering. It's uh, it's almost like pornographic in a way. Like it's going to be in your head. You're going to be thinking about it nonstop. So, the way to like shut that down, or the way to calm that down, or, or dampen that, or soften that a little bit is to eat. And I, you know, I know fasting is popular. I think it. I think it has its place. I think it's helped a lot of people. But the easy way out is never the real way out. Fasting is easier. Keto is easier. Both of those things are easier than trying to eat like a bodybuilder. A bodybuilder will eat five or six times a day, and they'll eat a balanced diet. They have protein, carbs, and fats in every single meal, but most of their meals are robbed of fat. That is a way harder That is a way harder thing to do day in and day out, doing that seven days a week. Hmm. That's why sometimes they'll have a cheat day or a cheat meal, or sometimes some of these guys will take like a couple weeks off, which isn't great in and of itself. They probably go too hard and they probably lower their fats too low. And that's why they have the cravings and the binging and they'll end up in a similar spot. Like some of these, uh, even female fitness competitors, sometimes they'll gain like 40 pounds, 50 pounds. These are small framed people that can't afford to gain 40 or 50 pounds. They'll gain 40 or 50 pounds post contest because they dwindled their calories down way too low. Hmm. And then they might have hormonal side effects and stuff. Cause again, I'm talking about lowering fat calories, but you can only lower them so low before yeah. your body starts getting really pissed at you. So I would just suggest to most people that you just never even mess with lowering, lowering your fats below like 50 or 60 for the day. Yeah, because you have, I mean, there's a, there's going to be a hormonal impact. There's a digestive impact. I mean, you need, you need fat to properly digest and assimilate food. Absolutely. The, it slows down the absorption. Yeah. You know, it's going to, it's going to help, it's going to help you feel uh, fuller for longer. Hmm. Where have you, because, I mean, you've been, again, steeped in this topic for such a long time and you, and you have such a wonderful podcast. And I, and one of the things that I love about your podcast is that, you bring on a lot of people who generally have like opposing viewpoints, you know, like you, you'll have like a vegan health yeah. guru and then you'll have like a, a bodybuilder and then you'll have, so where have you um, seen your views evolve most significantly over the past, we'll say five, 10 years? Uh, I would say that a, a lot of the guests that we've had on um, some of the stuff that's kind of shaped my thoughts and opinions over the last couple of years has been exactly what you were saying earlier is to see the, the, how dogmatic people can get. And then also see like people get mad and you know, they tend to get like, they tend yeah. to get mad. They tend to argue. And I'm just trying to, I'm thinking in my head, like what's useful. Like every once in a while on Instagram, I like to just mess around. And so like I'll roast some people or whatever. And it's just, it's just in fun. It's, it's in jest. I'm not, it's just for me to like play around. Yeah. But, it's important to have fun too. Doing yeah. What it is that you do. Exactly. Uh, but for the most part, I just want to try to find like what's going to be helpful and useful to people. And I also, I want to ask a question when somebody feels like they're so certain about something, I want to follow up on that yeah and say well how are you so certain with a lot of the studying that you're doing a lot of the stuff that you're coming across you know is there a link between sugar and dementia is there a link between diabetes and dementia it's like well 
it's it, this has been around for a while now and the information is gathering up more and more and so it does seem like there's a relationship there and not everyone that has diabetes or dementia is severely overweight so maybe someone could argue maybe they're maybe it'd be helpful if they lifted because maybe that would give some of the excess energy somewhere to go but like not all these people are obese either so you know it starts to get you to question and that's what i've been doing i've just been like really questioning not only the guests but then questioning myself and questioning my own thoughts of like well you know there is kind of an energy balance to the whole thing but energy balance aside does it still matter what foods you eat and does it still matter of your environment and i think that it does maybe not so much in controlling your body weight but i think that the human body requires a certain amount of movement every day i don't know how i came up with this number i just sort of made it up but i think that everyone needs about 7000 steps a day and i don't actually mean steps but you need 7000 you need something that mimics 7000 steps every day something that mimics a couple of miles of work every single day so you could go to a gym and that could be your you yeah. know that could be your 7000 steps but you need just think about it. it just makes sense i mean we evolved to walk and to probably carry something with us too because you're probably like all right we're going you know our tribe's going over here and you'd like load up a pack or whatever and you'd carry all your shit and your family would you know go and walk somewhere so i think the energy balance equation of the calories in calories out thing i think the general idea of that is good and i think it's helpful like yes you should watch your calories in and then you should also be mindful to get some calories out and if i understand that the calories in for a lot of people can be really difficult and if that is difficult just keep sticking with the calories out like just just don't give up don't stop just keep figure out a way to keep moving and maybe maybe you don't want to run maybe, maybe you Maybe it hurts your joints. Maybe you suck at it, whatever. Just walk, you know, start with walking. Maybe you don't love lifting, but in my opinion, you're going to need to get some sort of resistance training because I just think that the world that we're in right now, you're more more than likely going to overconsume, And it might just be that you're overconsuming sugar or carbs, or it might be that you're overconsuming calories for the day in general. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with that that i mean resistance training is super important and it's it's yeah it's all super important getting that that movement those 7000 steps which by the way is a very it's very impressive that you that you you're claiming that you just guessed that number cuz if i recall correctly there was like a meta analysis published a couple maybe like 2 years ago that found that that generally is the ballpark for mm. lowest all cause mortality in people under like 65 years old it was like 7,000 to 8,000 or something like that. I find uh, nutrition research and exercise stuff uh, to be really fascinating. Yeah. Um, one thing I usually say about it is like they never studied me. <laughs> you know, I usually say that because I, I don't know, like, it would be really disheartening to get a PhD in nutrition mm -hmm. and then to find out. Hey, if you just stick with eating natural foods and move around a little bit, you're going to be okay. Yeah, nutrition science is incredibly weak. And I find most uh, nutrition quote-unquote experts to be more concerned about uh, protecting their their sort like of... IP kind of thing. Yeah. Their IP, you know, yeah. and their perceived expertise and authority in the topic then it is actually pushing the science forward and um, being open-minded and, and thinking critically about, you know, about, uh, about the field, um, which, which has been so muddled by corporate interest in my view. And um, which is not to, to, to discredit it. I love nutrition science. You know, it's obviously I've, you know, I've dedicated. I think it's my, fascinating yeah, too. Of course. Like I, I love listening to, I listen to like a lecture for two hours. Yeah. I listen to nutrition stuff probably, uh, four or five days a week. I listen to two, three hours of it in a day. I just, I can't consume enough of it because it's just, it's so interesting to me because uh, the information, you know, uh, goes back and forth. Mm. 
uh, sometimes the information is like totally opposite. <laughs> yeah, it's frustrating to a lot of people. And other times it's you know, I'll, but I'll listen to like Alan Flanagan. I'll listen to the Proof podcast. I listen to your show. I listen to a lot of different. I'm trying to get stuff from Stan Efforting. I listen to Mike Isratel. Oh, he's great. Love listen to all these like bodybuilders, and I'll, I'll listen to uh, you know somebody talking about how many times a day they utilize insulin versus like growth hormone. Like, could be. I just find all of it to be super interesting, and I'm just kind of thinking in my head like, why is there such a such a huge separation? But if you if you think about what's common amongst most most of these individuals, whether it's somebody talking about veganism or somebody talking about carnivore, is most people are preaching, like, let's stay away from some highly processed foods. We did mention that there might be some safe ones out there that you can find. Um, so there's there's some stuff like that, but, you know, what are the, what are the commonalities? And, and one of the big ones is I think people think people uh, believe it's healthy to move, right? I think everyone's in, in agreement on some sort of movement. I think that most people, most of the information that we're seeing now about exercise like and lifting weights in particular is just really interesting to me because I've been lifting since I was 12 years old. And it's just something I fell in love with and I got lucky because both my brothers like to lift and that's how I got in into lifting in the first place. And so I've been lifting all these years being a meathead <laughs> and then now on every podcast you're hearing so many people talk about the benefits of strength training which is just funny to me because <laughs> it's like uh it's to me it's just like lifting you know it's, yeah. it's just so normal for me but uh, i love it i think it's great more people need to get into it more people um probably need to not worry too much about what other people are going to think of them in the gym because most of the time especially the people in the gym they're probably not thinking of you. They're probably thinking of checking out their own triceps. Yeah. Yours are looking pretty in, swole, my in friend. In the mirror. You're a genetic. You're you're definitely like you've got you've got the genes. Yeah, man, it's very very impressive. I think that the more somebody pre presents himself presents himself as a messianic figure in this, you know, in the field of in a field as complex as nutrition. The more skeptical you should be about mm. what it is that they're that they're offering, right? Because at the end of the day, like somebody like like I'm just a guy. Like I don't want anybody to think that I'm some kind of nutrition messiah, you know? Because right. I'm not. I'm like on this journey just like everybody else. And when you look at the field, when you zoom out and look at the field, as I said earlier, I mean it's the data is all so incredibly weak. I mean it's so hard to study nutrition. Nutrition is studying nutrition is way more difficult than studying drugs and it's way less well funded. Yeah. Right? So I mean That's a good point. Like a drug is like especially a powerful drug is probably going to make a change that you can measure really easily. Yeah. Where with food it's like, you know, I guess we can check your glucose and stuff, but we don't even really know what that does. Exactly. I mean there's people walking around with a glucose monitor thinking that they're going to be able to like burn fat better by monitoring their glucose and I don't I mean, I guess if you get deep into the definitions of like what burning fat is, then maybe you could potentially burn more fatty acids or oxidize more fatty acids if your insulin isn't consistently high. But I don't think it's a great, I don't think, I just don't think it's a great way to try to regulate body composition. Yeah. No, it's not. I mean, calories <laughs> trump glucose. Uh, your your daily energy intake is more important from a weight loss standpoint right. than glucose spikes, although glucose spikes might influence your hunger. So, you know, there are potential downstream effects of being right. on a glucose roller coaster, right? But, um, and eating the fat and carbs together isn't necessarily, at least from the information I have, isn't necessarily any more problematic from a standpoint of like what your body's going to do hormonally. Uh, but like you said, you might consume a lot of energy in a real, you eat a piece of cake, you might consume a lot of energy in a really short period of time. And that cake didn't really have much value because it didn't fill you up but here's where nutrition science just fails us miserably time and time again is they'll try to measure that piece of cake and it's like who the fuck eats a piece of cake <laughs> like who the, who the hell eats like first of all who eats one piece of cake mm. right secondly who just has a piece of cake randomly so you're normally going to eat something else before that and you have things like the thermic effect of food. You also have things like the second meal effect. 
which I don't know how well some of these things have been studied, but from some of the stuff I've seen, if you have protein an hour or two before a meal, it's supposed to help you regulate your glucose better. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of variables. And what about, um, I don't know, just if you had some fruit or you had this or you had that. I mean, there's cofactors in fruit and fiber that can also help regulate your blood sugar. So it's just... It's hard to really study because there's so many factors that come into play rather than just somebody eating a cookie or a, p- or a piece of cake. Yeah, drinking a glass of water before a meal reduces the amount of calories that you tend to eat. And the temperature, I think, of meal. the water even matters. Interesting. The temperature. I believe so. I think there's some sort of weird thing about uh, digestion. and cold. I, I forget what it is, so I won't mess it up. But <laughs> something about cold water and your digestion. And I think there's something even to the effect of like your body has to spend a little bit of energy to <laughs> to get the water to room temperature. Interesting. So you could potentially uh, burn more calories by drinking cold water, some shit like that. Yeah, I don't. So people, some people on cold eat, water diet. Yeah, the cold water we, diet. We're gonna I like coin that. it and sell I, it. I like that. Yeah, forty nine ninety nine. Let's get a book deal. We'll <laughs> yeah. co-write it. No, I mean I think all those tools help. Like people scoff at, you know. Cold, cold water immersion mm. and the calorie burn that you get from that saying, you know, they'll argue that it's insignificant compared to what you're actually eating on a daily basis in your diet. But I think what, you know, the more tools, the merrier for people. Like we live in, mm-hmm. the modern world is an all out assault on your waistline, on your metabolic health. And so the more weapons you can keep in your armory. <laughs> Do you know about the soleus push-up study? No, what the hell is that? The soleus push-up study is uh, just like as we're sitting here, we're just doing calf raises the whole time. Interesting. And it like, it was something amazing. This is just one study that was done. Uh, but it like increased the person's metabolism. Like it, it like doubled it. What do you mean? Just be doing seated? Doing seated calf raises. Wow. But it was for like eight hours. Wow. And it was just like on and off. And it wasn't the twitchy knee thing that everyone does like a lot well a lot of people do that i do that yeah a little twitchy knee thing it was just slow normal reps oh interesting but anyway regardless of like what that paper says by getting a little bit of exercise that area you just created another place for your body to disperse energy to Mm. and just in such simple terms if you were to wake up in the morning and let's say Let's say you have a kid. He's like 13 or something, and he loves cereal. Cereal is just like it's it's junk food, basically. It's not a great idea. However, if you can get that kid to get on a treadmill for just a couple minutes, even if he's just on there for three minutes, get a little incline going, well, now the, the carbohydrates that he's eating, now it has somewhere to go Yeah, because he, he did a little bit of work. He, he might not have – not going to burn all of it off, you right. know, but now you, you – uh, you sent the body a message. And I think when it comes to lifting, when it comes to cardiovascular stuff, I think I think it's actually fairly easy to send your body a message back to kind of what I was saying in the very beginning of the show. A little bit can go a long way. And if you're just starting out, a little bit is 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 all you all you probably uh, have at the at that point. But I think that it should be encouraging to you that that is going to get you really really far. Hmm. You see such huge progress from people when they first start and they'll they'll even tell you like, yeah, I barely know what I'm doing. I just kind of got in the gym and started moving around and it started to feel good. And hmm. so a couple of sets, a couple of reps. I mean, now at, at the very least, even if you have no clue of what you're doing, at least you're sending a signal to your body of like, hey, let's you did some biceps today. Let's dump some glucose into that area. Hmm. Yeah, it's so true. And the value of neat is also, um, I mean, the whole like calf shaking, fidgeting under the Mm -hmm. table, like that's all, that would all fall into the category of non-exercise physical activity, right? right? Which is So they say that you, you know, I think Lane Norton has kind of said that you can't increase that, Um, which I would disagree with because I think over a long period of time you can. I definitely move a lot more now than when I was 330 and I was powerlifting. Yeah. But I would also say that, uh, like neat is something that you don't necessarily you don't necessarily want to force it has to come th- you need proper nutrition I think we uh, everyone's so obsessed with losing body fat that they forget that you need nutrients in your nutrition and even even dumping macronutrients and even like 
submarining your fat too low or just getting rid of carbohydrates altogether. These things can be to your detriment because they can literally slow you down. So you're just gonna you're gonna want to move less. People will say uh, eat less and move more. It's actually almost scientifically impossible to do that because you're gonna like over a long period of time it would be nearly impossible to do that without feeling just so stressed and just feeling like crap hmm. because you need X amount of energy in to be able to put X amount of energy out. So people have to really be, you have to kind of nail it. And that's why it might be important for you to look at what you're eating for the day, like write it all out for the day, even maybe the day before, write out what you would like to eat and see if you can hit that up. Hmm. You know, like, uh, I don't know, like two servings of fruit, mm, two servings of protein, uh, two servings of vegetables. I'd like to be able to get that in. Maybe a serving of dairy sounds good. Maybe a protein shake, you know? And then it's like, there's your diet. Try to hit some of those markers and see if you can, see if you can do that day in and day out and see how you start to feel. If you want to get more technical about it, you can use a tracker or you can start to track your calories. But I think people don't have a good understanding of what they're consuming. Hmm, but you do hear people say all the time that they want to get shredded. They want to lean out and stuff like that. And having the proper energy balance is, is it's very, very difficult to randomly nail it. Yeah. You have to like precisely go in and, and look at it. You have to. Uh, pay attention to every meal that you have if, if you want to do that. And that really is from like the macro, I think probably the most important thing to nail down like a state of energy balance. Right. I've heard that if you're weight stable for a period of time, you can essentially just food journal and then kind of get the average, mm -hmm. you know, number of calories. I, but that, even that can be really difficult. I don't think the, you need to track and weigh stuff every day. I yeah. hope I'm not like sending that message necessarily. However, if you want to take things to the next level and you want to be really lean, yeah. it's important to keep in mind that most people that you see that are like shredded, you know, like uh, they look like they're almost ready for like a bodybuilding show or something like that. Like you. Like myself. Yeah. Uh, those people are really paying attention diligently to what they're consuming. Mm. And so if you want to, you know, if you want to lose 10 pounds and you weigh 300 pounds, you probably don't really need to track, right? You know, if you want to lose 10% of your body weight and you're anything above like 18% body fat or something, you probably don't really need to track that much. You probably ditch some carbs you probably ditch some fat and you're probably good. You still need to pay attention to what you're consuming, but you probably don't need to track it. But if you want to get shredded, you're going to have to do what everybody else does. Yeah. Pretty much everyone that's on like a stage or anyone that's, uh, uh, you know, on Instagram, showing you pictures of abs and stuff like that. Most of those people, they're eating under 100 grams of fat. They're eating one gram per pound of body weight and protein. And the carbohydrates shift depending on how much activity they have. But I would say one gram per pound at least for most of them. One gram per pound of carbohydrates. Of carbohydrates most likely too, yeah. So one gram per pound generally... Uh, of carbohydrates, one gram per pound of protein. And then um, your fats might, your fats would probably, you'd probably want your fats under 75. Hmm. And you're talking about like bodybuilders that are prepping for a contest pretty much. Somebody, yeah. Somebody who's trying to like really lean out and they might have hmm. to play with the carbohydrates in accords to like some of these bodybuilders, they're the, they train so hard that their carbohydrates might need to be like four or 500. Right. And depending on the size of the person, how much muscle mass they have. But I've always felt that I can get a lot out of a little bit with carbs. So I might eat carbs like, I, I view carbohydrates as a, um, a supplement. So I eat fruit almost every day. I have some sort of vegetable almost every day. But when it comes to like rice, potato, or like more direct carbohydrates, um, I do that sparingly. Like I did that this morning. I had, some, I had a bunch of egg whites. I was at, a, uh, at my hotel. Had a bunch of egg whites, a couple poached eggs, some fruit, and some sourdough bread. Mm. And I, that was my pre-workout before going and doing some legs with Huberman. Oh, man. That sounds like a great breakfast. Yeah, it was great. It, yeah. it, it felt good. And it feel, it just, 
this style of eating feels right to me. It doesn't feel... Every once in a while, you know, we'll have some sort of like family gathering or something. I'm like, oh man, that looks pretty good. <laughs> but for the most part, I'm pretty satisfied and satiated. I don't, I don't feel like it's a big sacrifice. Do you ever find yourself going off the rails? I used to do it quite a bit. So I, I used to be, I used to love like keto style diets. And one of the things I loved about a keto style diet was like the cheat meals. And, you know, I was just, I did that when I was really young. I started messing with that when I was like 18. So I started messing around with like a keto diet in like 1995 or something like that. Early, yeah. Yeah, I I, I, I loved it. And uh, Did you ever read uh, around that time the, the ketogenic diet by Lyle McDonald? Yep, I uh, read the original Body Opus from Dan Duchesne. Wow. And yeah, the, all the stuff from Lyle McDonald. And I love all that stuff. And ketones still to this day, they fascinate the shit out of me. Same. I still don't totally understand exactly what's going on with them, but... Uh, yeah, and, and even like supplementing ketones, I still play around with it all the time and try to figure out like, I don't know, ways of like cheating the system, if you will. <laughs> but uh, I don't really go off the rails food wise so much anymore. And the reason why I would say that is like, I, I just changed my, just, I changed my interpretation of the whole thing because there are no rails. That's my diet, you know? And so, um, I, I still might say cheat. I still might use it in passing. I still might say it because um, I might eat like a peanut butter cup or something or like a Snickers bar or like ice cream or something like that. But I don't do it the way I used to. The way I used to do it was if I was going to cheat, I was going to cheat big. Hmm. And I was going to, um, I think this is from uh, Jordan Syatt. Jordan Syatt said, uh, he goes, you know, so the way we eat sometimes doesn't make any sense. He's like, imagine going out to your car. And you see that somebody slashed a t slashed a tire. He goes, and then you just pull out a knife out of your pocket and slash the rest of them. <laughs> He's like, that's the way we treat our diet. So you have like two slices of pizza at a party. It's like all an all or nothing mentality. And then you're driving to Seven Eleven and you're picking up uh, fish food from Ben and Jerry's. Mm. <laughs> that's my favorite one, by the way. Yeah, well, fish food. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've had it. Fish food and half baked. Is half baked what cookie dough? It's cookie dough and like brownie dough, I think. Oh my god! And the tonight dough—that one's a good too. Tonight dough. Tonight dough. Yep. What the hell is that? That's uh, I don't, I forget what's in there, but it's uh, Jimmy Kimmel's uh, <laughs> Jimmy Kimmel's Ben and Jerry's. Interesting. You don't wow. get to be three hundred thirty pounds without knowing all these things. Yeah, no, I'm sure. I'm sure coming really handy, especially during a bulk. But yeah, I don't really go like I wouldn't say. I'm just trying to even think of like an example. Um, Every once in a while, I'll just be like, oh, let's just get some pizza. And uh, me and my son will order some pizza. And my, my son, uh, he's in the lifting and stuff too. So uh, sometimes he'll sneak something, you know, from our pantry or something like that. He's like, don't look. <laughs> <laughs> is it like a full-on pizza, like the real deal? Or is it, do you go for like a gluten-free version or like a healthier form of pizza? Usually just go right, you know. Yeah. Like you're just going in. You might as well just go for it. You might as well just go for it. And I do, I do still try... And what I communicate to people, I do help a lot of friends and family and stuff with diet. Um, what I'll try to communicate to them, because they're just in a different spot, I'll say, I know it's a pain in the ass, but have a chicken breast. You know, have a chicken breast before you do your, you're going to go out and you're going to go enjoy a night with your wife and you're going to go, you can eat whatever you want when you're there. But before you go, like an hour before you go, eat a chicken breast. Just something to kind of like soften the blow of them being so hungry. Because you know that they're going to get there. The bread's going to be put on the table. They just ingested 500 calories before their salad even came. Their salad is 800 calories or 1,000 calories because they just, you know, dump all the dressing on there. All the dressing, the croutons, the cheese. Yeah, now we're like, man, we're just, we're really stacking it up, you know. So let's. But still, uh, you know, as they say, like in a fight, protect yourself at all times. I think it's really a valuable lesson for uh, when you're trying to get your footing with nutrition is you can't really let your guard down all the way. And even if your guard does get down all the way, let's say that you do have like a blowout. You just you eat bad on like a Friday and now it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Oh, I'm starting on Monday. You have that whole thing. Even if you just completely went off the rails on your diet for the weekend, at least try to stay connected to some steps or some movement or some lifting 
just don't allow everything to fall apart all at one time. Yeah, I love that. Just you know, it's hard though because what will happen is psychologically, when you bombard yourself with that much food, even though it is extra energy, um, you're lethargic usually. Mm. You usually don't feel good, and you know that kind of brings us to something else to try to consider. And this is what I like to do during the day, but I'm not so good at doing this at night. Is when you eat a meal, it's great to get full. It's great to fill up pretty pretty well. But it's not great to be stuffed. You know, I don't I don't think I know sometimes you want that feeling with certain foods that you eat because it's fun. The food tastes good. And you just really want to be like, oh my God. But I think that if you were to keep in mind, uh, especially during the day, that when you get yourself to be full, you probably your best bet is to just recognize that you're not hungry any longer. Hmm. So it's not, you're not stuffed. You're just no longer hungry. And another barometer for that would be, could you go out and go on like a light jog or can you go out and walk kind of fast? If not, then you might've overdone it. And if you find yourself overdoing it time and time again, just try to over a period of time, talk yourself into just eat a little bit less, push the food away. You can even get on your phone. You can text, you can email Sometimes if you just ate and you give it like maybe about three or four minutes, you're usually good. And, and it's, it's hard though, because those three or four minutes, you're still thinking about that food, thinking about that food, you're still very connected to it. So if you're someone that has an issue with overeating, uh, that's what I recommend you try. And also just eat slower, right? A hundred percent. Yeah, we yeah. don't, we, yeah. It's rare that we chew our food. Yeah. When I stuff myself, I feel disgusting. Right. And I, it's, I always regret it. I don't mind eating to a point of fullness or maybe just, just, just barely like a hair underneath that. Like right. that's, that's fairly easy for me. But there are, there are times when I just like go off the rails myself and I just stuff myself and right. I feel horrible. What's afterwards. like your favorite food? I mean, I could, I definitely have a sweet tooth. So if, uh, you know, I, a couple months ago we had a birthday party for my one year old niece and my brother bought this, uh, went to the super high end bakery in LA and got this mm. keto carrot cake, grain free keto carrot cake. And it was just so delicious that I ate like six <laughs> slices of it. It was so good. That sounds amazing. Dude, it was so fire. And, uh, and I just ate a ton of it and I felt disgusting afterwards. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to say that it wasn't worth it because it was, you know, like there is something to be said about just drowning yourself mm -hmm. in something that you find really delectable. Um, but, you know, you just have to be able to, I think it's really important that the decisions that you may, that you make are with full informed consent, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, I pretty much knew going into it that I was going to, um, be overdoing it. Um, I think sometimes a good way to look at that and the way I look at alcohol is, you know, is this going to enhance this moment or am I just kind of, yeah. I think sometimes some people listen to some of our, you know, content and they're probably like, man, these guys, they really think a lot. <laughs> Fucking hey, like I just want to eat or just want to drink. And, and that's great if you're in that spot, if you're able just to kind of, but for me, I'll have a control issue. I won't be able to, I won't be able to keep myself uh, under wraps. I don't have any issues with alcohol. Luckily, Same. I could drink, I can take it, I could leave it. It really doesn't bother me one way or the other. So I've been really fortunate with that, but with food, <laughs> I think about food from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed. Yeah. I think about it all the time. I mean, even, you know, even coming here and stuff like that, planning out like, oh, you know, when am I going to. But you're not thinking about it. And correct me if I'm wrong. You're not. I don't think that you're thinking about it because you're, you're hungry all the time. You're thinking about it because you're incredibly passionate about body composition and feeling good and maximizing your gains and all that stuff. And it's so it's a like, huge part of it. But I also am pretty hungry a lot of times. Too. Okay. Yeah. I'm like thinking like, oh, well, what I will think of is like. How do I, how do I get the hunger out of my head almost? Like what, you know, what can I, what can I eat that is not going to have that much energy in it, but it's going to have protein in it, hmm. uh, that is going to get me to the next three or four hours or whatever. You know, I'm not like ravenously like dying for it, but like in my bag to, uh, go back, uh, home to Sacramento, I have, uh, 
like uh, these carnivore crisps. You know, I got like basically like a jerk beef jerky type thing. And then I got like, you know, I bring protein powder with me and like. I do that. I always make sure I got stuff because. And, and it's something I try to advise people on too is you'll never shop when you're hungry. Hmm. You'll look at that shopping cart when you're done shopping and you go, who the hell bought all this shit? <laughs> There'd be like all kinds of junk food and all kinds of crap in there. So, and, and even it's a good hack, you know, before you go to eat, I was mentioning earlier, like the dinner scenario, anytime you're about to go eat or anytime you're about to go, you're going to go to a relative's house. You're trying to do better on your diet. You have no idea what they're serving. Uh, maybe the rest of the family kind of always eats junky stuff and, you've tried to communicate with them before that you're making changes and they don't get it or whatever. Eat your stuff at home. Hmm. Just, and if you end up eating uh, at the party, uh, so what? Not a big deal. Like this is a consistency thing and consistency, consistency at first is going to look very inconsistent. So if you go to the gym, uh, you go to the gym Monday, Tuesday, and then you miss the rest of the week, some people are like, oh, you fell off. But if Monday and Tuesday was the first time you ever went to a gym, that's better progress because you made it for at least two days, right? Mm. The next week, maybe you get in there on Wednesday. And the next week, maybe you only get in there on Monday. Maybe the next week you miss. And then maybe the next week you're back in there for two days. And then maybe, like it's going to look like crap in the beginning. Your diet's going to look like crap in the beginning. You're going to listen to stuff that you and I say, and you're going to say, you write some stuff down. It's like one gram of protein per pound, and one day you're going to nail it. You'd be like, man, I nailed it right on the right on the spot. And then the next day you're going to be eating Ben and Jerry's. The next day you're going to, you know. And so just take these things super slow. It could be as simple as I would like to get a walk in tomorrow, and I'd like to have one meal that I feel is really healthy to start there it sounds like the weakest thing ever and i think a lot of dudes don't like stuff like that because i don't think in their head they can figure out how is that going to work a lot of men that i've helped over the years they're all or nothing they're like no i want to do keto no, i want to do carnivore and that's those have their place the, those are great but you're going to do carnivore for january february you're going to do some half version of it we I help you lose 15 pounds and then where are we in March and you know what I mean and yeah. it just starts to unravel and it's like man you I used to have a group of friends I'd work out with at like four in the morning and I told them one day I was like I, I can't do this anymore because I'm, I'm going to bed at like seven and I really enjoy my time with my kids and, and they're not going to bed till like eight or nine they're older now and uh I gave both guys a key that you could still come to the gym <clears throat> and they, they didn't do it on their own and they wouldn't go like at other times. They loved that over commitment of that 4am cause it was like hardcore. Interesting. And I found that with a lot of people. I'll sometimes, sometimes somebody will say, Hey, should I do carnivore? And I usually say something like it's, it's not a bad idea to try it for a handful of days, but you might want to have a little bit of fruit, a little bit of vegetables, a little bit of extra variety so that you could stretch this out and do it for like a longer period of time. And then it'll be like, oh, okay, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. I don't have that gene. I'm not like that at all. <laughs> yeah. I'm not like that at all either. I, I don't mind. I don't mind looking at something and just being like, oh man, okay. Uh, I'm not going to be proficient at it at first, but two years from now, three years from now, 10 years from now. And I think I got that from lifting. It was a gift. Uh, luckily, I started lifting when I was young. And, you know, building strength and stuff wasn't, I didn't really think about it that much until, well, it, it was it was only a couple years later, but I was already lifting for like four or five years before I started really thinking about strength and strategically like building strength. But I was already strong because I was already lifting. Hmm. But I was, I just knew from the beginning that this whole process for me to look like my brothers, my brother, Chris is four years older than me. My brother, Mike was six years older than me and all their friends. You know, when you're a little kid, your, your brother's friends or your, uh, or friends that are older than you, they're like God figures to you, you know? And these guys, like, I, I think back, I'm like, were they really that big? <laughs> 
but I think they were. You know, I think they were like some of these guys were like 260, 280, 290. Is that how you got into lifting? Yeah, my brothers uh, got me into it when I was young, and I started did out. Did they take it as? Did they take it as far as you have? Um, my oldest brother Mike was very strong. Uh, I saw him squat 500 pounds for like 10 reps. Jesus. Yeah, he was a monster. Uh, he he died a couple of years ago, or like more like 15 years ago. Uh, he had uh, mental health dis- issues, and he had drug addiction and stuff like that. And then my brother Chris, uh, he's always been really strong too. I want to say I've seen him, uh, well, actually even like as of a year ago, I think he did like a 700-pound deadlift. And he's got uh, two uh, double hip replacement. Wow. So he's got like, you know, he's got titanium hips and he's deadlifting all this crazy weight. So strength has always been kind of a, a big thing in our household. My dad actually bought us weights when my brother Chris was probably about 16 because Chris was born with uh, his knee his legs were just kind of like uh, bowed out they were like bow legged and his knees just gave him tremendous amounts of pain so he had surgery on both the knees when he was young and the chiropractor that he went to was a power lifter and my brother one time he's like you gotta come come with me to to meet this uh meet my chiropractor he's like my chiropractor is really jacked and we were we were into wrestling and stuff like that at the time and we were all like a little bit getting into like lifting and stuff and uh so i went with him one time and the chiropractor told my brother he's like you're never going to be out of pain unless you're strong Mm. he's like so your solution is going to be just get as strong as possible and he had my brother squat with like a broomstick on his back and then i would say it was like maybe Two years later, my brother competed uh, at a high school national championship meet for powerlifting. He squatted 675. Oh, my God. And my my brother's not a huge guy. He's like 5'6", so he, he did that at like 220 pounds. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. But, yeah, I've always liked uh, strength training, and, you know, it's always it's been a huge part of our, huge part of our life. Hmm. Wow, what a cool story. Those numbers seem inconceivable to me, just because of my like low back right. stuff and you know just the my own body mechanics but um but that's insane that that it's so that strength training is so embedded into your family makeup and just probably like i mean you know you you have good dna obviously you have yeah. good genes for this yeah my brother's had a huge uh impression on me and uh i just kind of grew up in the gym wow the first gym i ever went to it's called mid hudson bodybuilding and he was Everything you would think of, of a gym on the East Coast. I grew up in New York, uh, and this is like probably early '90s, maybe, yeah, maybe even like late '80s. Everybody had a mullet. <laughs> uh, a lot of people working out in like jeans for some reason. I don't know why. Interesting. Or like those old school clown pants, you know, the bodybuilding pants, the big baggy. That sounds more comfortable than jeans. Like MC Hammer pants, and yeah. then also like work boots. I don't know why weird outfits yeah but um a lot of these uh, a lot of these guys were pretty damn big one thing that's interesting is that at that time there was no girls in the gym hmm. it was like really rare like every once in a while there might be a uh someone that a girl that really loved lifting but not like it is now i mean you see there's and then the female lifters right now are unbelievable power lifters i mean there's girls um, deadlifting, you know, right around 700 pounds and stuff like that. It's just unbelievable. And it's common to, to go to a powerlifting meet and see a girl squat 300 pounds, 400 pounds. And you got to keep in mind, too, a lot of these girls weigh like 165, 145. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. I'm glad I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot, there are a lot, a lot of women in the space are way stronger than, than I'll ever be, you know, with, with, especially with those lifts. It's uh it's really ins- impressive and inspiring. And I think now with all the data coming out about how important resistance training is and strength training is for longevity, hmm. I think that it's uh we're, we're probably going to age much differently than generations prior. I think that's interesting. Yeah. The verdict is still out, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Maybe we're, Maybe we're right and maybe we're not. I don't know. Fitness also breaks a lot of people, though, too. Hmm. There's a lot of people that I know that uh, kind of over fitness. You know, they have lower back issues, elbow, knee, hip. Uh, you end up liking it. 
so much that you do it to your detriment. And that's something else I try to share on my podcast is it's cool to love it. It's cool to love jujitsu. It's cool to love running. It's cool to love lifting. But don't love it so much that it's to your detriment. Don't love it so much that you can barely get off the couch. Don't love it so much that you're uh, you know, going to tear something or just have yourself in danger. So, mm. Yeah, I was going to ask, how has your <laughs> lifting regimen or even your, your dietary strategy shifted as you've gotten older now that you have longevity and aging mm. well sort of within, within view? Well, you know, when I was powerlifting, it was just like, let's consume as much as we can because we're trying to get bigger. And so I went from when I competed when I was younger, I went all the way from like 198 to 220 to 242 to 275 to 308, all the way to the super heavyweight Jeez. weight class. And uh, luckily for me, um, I was only uh, stuck in this world of fatness <laughs> or this time period of fatness for um, like about four or five years. So hopefully uh, the stuff that I did then uh, had didn't have too much damage. But along with, you know, along with the food was also drugs. I took a lot of, I took a lot of performance enhancing drugs, a lot of anabolic steroids, uh, a lot of testosterone and all kinds of stuff. It was just, I just got obsessed with it. I just loved it. I love powerlifting and in powerlifting um, and in a lot of bodybuilding they they don't test. It's untested. They, they have federations that you can go into that are tested and they have other ones that they just don't call anything. Those are the untested federations. And so that's what I did. I, that's what I competed in that. And uh, my food back then was, I mean, I remember, you know, my wife would go to bed around 9 or 10 o'clock. And I would give her a kiss and say, I got to stay up because I got to eat. So I would have already eaten, you know, four or five meals for the day. And I just felt like I'm like, I need to eat more food <laughs> to get bigger. Wow. So I went, you know, like I said, going from 240 to 260 to 270. It wasn't really that hard for me to put on uh, body weight, but it was a little bit of a job. I had to like constantly uh, feed myself. But what was interesting at that time is that I started to discover uh, a lot of weird things. Like my my lifting went in accordance to the way I ate sometimes. So I used to do something I called bench bagels <laughs> and I would eat a bunch of bagels before I'd go to the gym. And, you know, nowadays people talk a lot about gluten and the inflammation that gluten gives you and stuff. Uh, but I used to say the gluten's free. So I would go and <laughs> eat these, eat these bagels that had gluten in them. And it would actually swell me up. Like my fingers would feel swollen. My joints would kind of feel swollen but I might gain like six or eight pounds just from ingesting a couple bagels and some water. And I go to the gym and I was so much stronger. Wow. <laughs> it was like a, like a kind of a, almost like a superpower. Hmm. And so it sounds so strange and sounds so odd for people to probably hear this, especially now, uh, the way that I eat now is just so different. So, I mean, it's just a complete 180. And some of that 180 was, uh, I fell with a big squat. I did a 1,085 squat. I'm sure a lot of people have seen it on the internet. Um, one leg kind of just shot inward. One leg kind of shot outward. Luckily, nothing, well, I don't know if anything broke because I never went to the hospital or never went to the doctor. But Whoa. I got jacked up. And I was, I was messed up from that fall for probably a good like six months. Wow. Three months of like... Sounds like it could have been much worse. Yeah, three months of like not being able to walk very well. Whoa. Uh, and then the six months, by the six month period, I was able to like finally start to squat and stuff like that. But my ankle and my knee, they were really jacked up. And so that just, that right there made me just rethink everything. Um, and uh, I just, I zoomed way out and said, okay you know, we've got to, we've got to change course here. Mm. You know, you already squatted 1,080. You already benched 854. I deadlifted 766, but I just always wanted more. I wanted to squat 1,100, deadlift 800, and bench 900. And I was like, this is just never ending. You know, you fell. You could have died. Someone spotting you could have died. No one died. No one got hurt that bad. It was just me that got hurt a little bit. And uh, 
I can live with that. So let me just kind of move on from that. Take that as like a warning shot, you know? And so from that point on, I started to implement some of the old things that I used to do. I started implementing more of a keto diet. I started a war on carbs. I wrote a book called the war on carbs and just started to drop weight. And I, but I still wanted to power lift because I was like, I'm not leaving that way. I'm not, I want to leave on my own terms. So I went back into powerlifting, did a couple powerlifting meets just to get that out of my system and kind of say fare, farewell to the sport and uh, and move on. But yeah, from that point on, it's been, I've been just fascinated with nutrition and I've been obsessed with it. When I was 330 pounds, my blood pressure was high. Uh, I got some blood work done. Uh, Stan Efferding was actually working with me back then, not at my not at my fattest, but he was working with me, uh, as I was coming down in weight and my blood pressure was, was wild. My glucose was off the charts. Like just things were just, they weren't good. Uh, my blood was also, uh, thick from taking performance enhancing drugs. So I got thick blood and high blood pressure. It's like, that's just asking for problems. That's Mm. just asking for a heart attack. And so, uh, luckily, uh, Stan helped me a ton uh, giving me more information and, um, he and I went back and forth on a lot of stuff and he was trying to have me eat, uh, I guess a little bit more like a bodybuilder, eat some rice and stuff like that and, and follow like more like the vertical diet. But for me, I struggled with that because my previous keto background was like, if I'm eating carbs, I'm cheating. So it was no fault of Stan's diet. It was my, it was my fault of like, Carbs meant like green light to to go and eat whatever mm. I wanted, and so I had to work on like taming that and figuring that out and change. You know, just made like a one eighty change from there. And now, now I I try to share with people just eat meat, don't eat, and repeat. Eat meat, don't eat, repeat. If you're not hungry for meat, then you're not actually hungry. Mm. You have what I call fake hunger. If you're not hungry for a hard boiled egg. You're not actually hungry. I know people think hard boiled eggs are gross, but <laughs> if you're not hungry for meat, if the steak that you cooked last night that's sitting in your fridge doesn't sound appetizing, it's because you're not actually hungry. If you were hungry, you would be like, oh my God, this is amazing. And you would eat it cold. Wow. What a great insight. <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, hard boiled eggs can be very gross. But if, <laughs> if I, I find that with those. Everything bagel seasoning is the key. Is it? Yeah. Interesting. I don't think I've ever tried that. It works. But that's that's so fascinating. It's such a great uh, insight that if you're not hungry for meat, then you're probably just eating out of boredom or whatever, right? Yep. And it's just, I think it's a, it's just good to have some self-awareness. Yeah. You know, we all have blind spots. We all have uh, areas that we can improve upon. We all have areas where we can do better. But imagine, you know, as you're going through your day, like, why am I doing this? Yeah. What, why, um, why did I make fun of that person? Like, well, why did I say that? That's interesting. Like, why not just review it? Like, you don't have to come down on yourself. You don't have to smash yourself over it. Um, yeah, why did I eat that candy? I I just told somebody the other day, I just I just hired a trainer. Why did I, you know, why did I eat pizza? Or what, you know, just good to examine some of that stuff and just kind of ask yourself, where the heck did that come from? Why did I have the second slice of that pizza that wasn't even that good? <laughs> Why yeah. do we have a second slice? So why is the first one not sufficient? Yeah. Why doesn't it work a little bit more like sex? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, you, it's, I mean, for a guy, it's like hard to be repeatable, right? After yeah. you. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> it's true though. Very true. Yeah. How come like you can't eat a pizza and just be like, ah, oh. right. I mean, you kind of are, but then you want like more. Do you, have you refined your stance on carbs? Cause I find a lot of people, they cut, they think that they're cutting out carbs by cutting out foods like French fries, fast food, burgers, and pizza. When in reality, it's not necessarily that those are carb foods though. Those are foods, foods that are rich in both carbs and fats yeah. and usually hyper palatable and thus hard to, hard yeah, to moderate. I think I heard that first from uh, Lane Norton was where I heard him uh, pointing that out, saying, "Look, these things are more rich in fat calories than they are carbs." Like a pure carb would be a baked sweet potato, a baked potato with nothing on it, right? And a baked potato actually is one of the most satiating by itself mm-hmm. is one of the most satiating foods that you can eat. <laughs> like there's, there's literally been there's a there was a yeah, satiety index study study or whatever. Yeah, yeah and it's like the most of the foods at the top of that 
cont- a hierarchy are protein based foods because mm. protein is the most satiating macronutrient, but baked potato is right up there as well. <laughs> you right. Know? Yeah, I think it's, I kind of always viewed uh, nutrition to be a little bit like this. Like it's sometimes hard to give somebody like the, yeah, it's hard to give somebody the right message and it's very hard to give somebody the right message uh, really, really quickly, you know? So if, if I was in an elevator with somebody and someone says, Hey, you know, how'd you get in shape like this? And we go back and, oh, it's consistency, you know, and as they're walking out, I would say, and don't eat any carbs, you know, because <laughs> I think it's like the, the quickest, it's like the quickest way, not that you wouldn't eat any carbs. Yeah, but it's also, as you talked about earlier, like oil is very calorie dense. So, I mean, right, right. is it the carbs or is it the oil? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, I would just say that for most people, because there's just, there's just, uh, there's such great access to a lot of things that are calorically dense and and uh, carbohydrate dense and carbohydrate rich, and you can't cut out fat, you can't cut out protein, but you kind of can cut out carbs, and you can moderate carbs. So it might be more of a message of like, hey, only eat 50 carbs. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, fats are essential. You need fat. I think you kind of. I personally kind of think that you do need a little bit of carbohydrate. I actually think that, you know, the word need is interesting. You'd have to sort of define that and then go back and forth from mm-hmm. there. But I have found personally, maybe you found something similar that, uh, towing the line and being like near keto seems to be about right. Hmm. Uh, but just perpetually being in ketosis, I don't think is a great spot to be in. Yeah. Like using as you, said earlier, which I thought was so smart, uh, using carbs like a supplement, like titrating up based mm-hmm. on your needs. Maybe, you know, you're, you've just had a surgery and you're under bed rest, right? Doctor's orders. You bring the carbs down a little bit. Um, I think that makes, that makes a ton of sense. How are you eating right now? I eat a, a pretty moderate carb, um, diet. Like I'm hitting those, those protein goals. I, pr- I prioritize protein. I'm doing generally like one gram of protein per pound of my weight, which is like 185, 190. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I kind of, I bookend my workouts with carbs. I eat some, some carbs in the morning. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah. And then I'll do, I used to like push my first meal to noon or 1 PM or mm-hmm. whatever. But now I think that there's real value in eating protein soon after I wake up, you know, halting that muscle protein breakdown yep. from the overnight fast. And then I work out. I'm a morning lifter. And then after my workout, I usually will do uh, like a piece of, you know, like eight ounces of steak, some steamed broccoli, mm. sweet potato, more carbs around that. Um, you ever have a Japanese sweet potato? Oh, those are so good. That's my favorite. No one ever knows about them for some oh, reason. I try to tell people about them all the time. They're white sweet potatoes. They're so good. Yeah, they're amazing. They, uh, yeah, they just, it tastes way better than a yam or a sweet potato to me. Mm. Yeah, they're bomb. I love those. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. And then for dinner, I do the same thing. Like I, you know, I've been eating, I've been eating car- like s- s- carbs with every meal pretty much. And I, if I want, if I were to get, if I were to try to get leaner than I am now, which I'm pretty happy with my co- body composition right now, but I would probably just cut back a little bit on the carbs, mm-hmm. you know, maybe in, you know, at dinner and kind of keep them more kind of centered around my workout. Um, but yeah, always prioritizing protein, always whole food, primarily whole foods with some protein shakes thrown in and some fun foods thrown in, but primarily whole foods, protein centric, lots of whole fruit, vegetables, things like that. I think something to think about for people is uh, with the certain foods that you eat, like how are you going to eat them? You know, when it comes to fruit, it's like you just grab some fruit and just eat it. You grab a strawberry and I don't know, maybe you rinse it off and you, you eat it. Um, banana, apple, a lot of these things, but a piece of bread. Yeah. You know, a piece of bread is like a a vehicle of other calories probably. Mm. So you're probably going to put like butter on it. I mean, yeah, bread tastes so good to me. Like the sourdough I ate this morning, I just ate it plain because I didn't want the extra calories because I'm aware of that. But it's just something to keep in mind. You know, people sometimes are like, I love vegetables. Do you really like? Do you actually really enjoy vegetables? Because a lot of times people are drowning them in oil. Or if you go to a restaurant, definitely it comes in a plate of oil, and it's like, I don't, uh, man, I 
I don't. I think that that is. Uh, I think that's terrible for you. Like a yeah. big old plate of like vegetables just sitting in some oil. Maybe some butter put on there at the end or something to get some flavor. I understand it, but uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. No, you're a hundred percent right, and that's why I think at a in a restaurant setting, the piece of grilled meat is going to be the best option for you. And usually, I mean, I know it's important, generally speaking, to you know, that people eat their fruits and vegetables. But in the restaurant setting, vegetables tend to be a recipe for just a caloric fat bomb and usually not the healthiest fats either. I was in a restaurant this weekend. Friday night, I went to dinner at a restaurant and um, I ordered a side of vegetables, but I told the waiter, I literally, I it's probably the first time I've ever actually done this. I told the waiter, can you ask them to just steam the vegetables? It was like a side of mixed vegetables. Right. Can you ask them to steam it no, and, and keep them dry? Like no oil, no butter. And uh, they brought them out and it was perfect. It was like... I felt so good about it. I, I think we should be able to like, there should be like a code. We should be able to say something, you know, like to, to the waiter, you know, when you go to the certain restaurants and stuff, uh, you always feel like you have to like kind of explain yourself. It'd be great if you could just tell them like a code word and they just got it, you know, like yeah. they understood, like you didn't want any like oil. I went to a restaurant not that long ago. It was actually a nice restaurant and uh, I ordered salmon. And I said, uh, could you just make sure it's not cooked in any oil? I didn't think it would be cooked in oil because it's salmon. I mean, salmon's kind of oily anyway. And uh, the waitress was like, oh, let me see if we can do that. And then she came back and she said, the uh, chef said he can't do that. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, that doesn't really, <laughs> I, I'm not trying to be rude, but that doesn't actually really make any sense because you just cook the fish the same way. It's just, you just don't add any oil to it. And she's like, all right, let me try again. So they, they did it, but it was like, they made it seem like such a, a hard thing to figure out. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, I'm sympathetic to the, to, to the, you know, the, the, the staff at restaurants and the chefs ultimately that are like, look, if you want it. So if you want me to prepare your food so specifically, then just freaking eat at home, yeah. you know? So on I the one hand, too. Yeah, on the one hand, I agree. You know, I would I would understand that sentiment, but on the other hand, you know, a simple modification like that, it's not. It shouldn't. It's not like rocket science, you know. <laughs> yeah. But um, but yeah, and I like the other tip that you offered about poached. Or you said that you this morning you had poached eggs. Right. Poached eggs is a great way to get eggs generally without oil. You know. Right. And eggs have plenty of their own fat, so it's not like you need to add more fat to whole eggs. Poached eggs are delicious too. I love them. Yeah, dude, Mark, this was so fun. Thanks for coming in, man. I appreciate it, man. This is uh, great to see your spot, and uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, brother. Let's uh, do a round two um, at some point. One last question for you before we get to that. Where can people connect with you on social media? How can they find your show and support you in all the many ways? I'm at Mark Smelly Bell on Instagram, and uh, the podcast is Mark Bell's Power Project. And strength is never weakness, and weakness is never strength. I love that. Last question, I guess, has everybody on the show. What does living a genius life mean to you? Wow. <clears throat> I think I think all of us are I think all of us have stuff within us that we are unaware of. We have capabilities and strength uh that is that maybe hasn't been discovered yet. When I think of the word genius, I immediately think like I'm not in that category. But I also think that all of us have genius within us. Any person can uh, say something unique. Any person can say something different. Even, even a five-year-old kid, we could say, hey, you know, give us some cool information on nutrition. And they might say, eat an apple every day. You know, they're, they're going to have like some sort of witty or cool comeback. Um, you look at the case of like people that are comedians. Uh, they're, they're thinking on their feet. I know they rehearse their stuff a lot, but I, I think that's a form of genius, being really funny. I think um, what you see like a skateboarder or a snowboarder or athletes do, I think athletes are genius. I think what Michael Jordan was able to do is genius. It's just, it's just not talked about the same way because I think usually you're attaching genius to like some form of uh, intellectual intelligence that we can like kind of pin down and measure in some way. Like this guy's a great writer or he's a great scientist and I think that's usually how we define it. But I think, you know, the artist, the uh, the drummer, the the piano player, so on, all these people have genius in them. And I think genius is um, 
for me, I think genius is exploring things and uh, consistently kind of finding where you're wrong, almost almost like uh, you're your own scientist in a way. And so I think, uh, for me, I think that's like what an expression of uh, a genius life is. Mm, I love that, man. Well, you definitely have genius in you. And uh, grateful to know you and to call you a friend. Thanks again for coming out. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here, and I'll see you there.